Our goal this evening is to really share more about the history of the artist, her life and times and work that may not be obvious um, because she's such a unique um, career and such a unique person. And there are truly uh, no better people um, to share the primary experience uh, from the artist. So I have to do my, I'll make it brief. Um, so we can get to the heart of the argument here. And so what we are going to do is it's less, um, we're not going to really lecture to everyone here. I proposed to Kaylee and to Daniel last night that I would, I would just give a, a, an idea. I would, I would promote concept and about Carmen and her life and work, and then they would begin to take it. And it'll be, I said, either ping pong or pinball, but we will work that out. Um, <clears throat> so Kaylee's here next to me. Kaylee is right now the director of Listen Gallery, a director of Listen Gallery, and has been there for quite a while, I think since uh, 2019, and in Los Angeles and New York. And Kaylee is a primary, um, she works with Carmen's work um, very, very closely um, with a group of people who have come to know the artist just very intimately over the past few years. And we'll talk more about her emergence, Carmen's emergence into the the, the contemporary art world and the appreciation of her work that has been going on for decades. And before that, Kaylee was at Phillips Auction as head of Latin art, uh, Latin American art, excuse me, as a vice president. And before that, she was working at a gallery. I found out um, Marianne Martin Fine Art, and she knew the work of Luis Cruz Azacedo, who is currently here at Ogden Museum. Um, and people are always curious how you become a, a gallery director, and she started off uh, with an art history degree from Tufts University. We've turned off the air conditioning, I can tell immediately. Um, Daniel Palmer is presently the chief curator at the Savannah College of Art uh, Museum of Art. Right? Savannah College of Art and Design Museum of Art. Um, and before that, he was a curator at the Public Art Fund New York and presented uh, Carmen Herrera's work along with a number of artists that you will recognize in marquee names in beautiful public spaces and activating um, an exchange between the art and the space and the people who got to view it. Um, and before that, um, Daniel was the Leon Levy Assistant Curator at the Jewish Museum and before that, a curatorial assistant at the Whitney Museum of American Art. Um, I did count. Daniel's very active. Uh, I counted 76 projects in 10 years. I didn't update the latest. I have to say. Daniel S. .com to see the full list of um, things that he's, he, he has done. So we know a little bit about Carmen Herrera and her work. She was born in 1915 in Havana, Cuba. And we, sh we have the work in our midst from the auspices of the Porges Corridor Sculpture Exhibition, as you know, and we screened a film here about her life and work, and the, the fact that this documentary exists and what it told us about Carmen and her work is pretty extraordinary because she arrived at you know, notoriety, fame, appreciation, and importance at a unique time in her life, at an arc usually past where artists, you would think, are, are becoming established. And we're, that will be a, a large part of what we talk about tonight, but not the only thing, because um, Kaylee and Daniel have insights that I really don't think you can get anywhere else, so I want to leave it um, to them. But Carmen saw a lot in her lifetime. She lived in Cuba, she lived in the United States, she lived in Paris, she knew artists, she worked with artists, she had an incredibly supportive partner and her husband who really insisted throughout her career that she only do that and stick to that and, and make the art that she knew she needed to make, wanted to make, and uh, with or without an audience. And then on the formal side of it, Carmen was doing work that was really extraordinary at a time where um, probably uh, even if she had gotten recognition and appreciation, it wouldn't have been for the monumentality and the, and the uh, visual an intellectual tenacity that her work has that we appreciate in the moment. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that too, and how she came to have some of the recognition that she has. The um, slideshow that uh, Hope is behind us is a combination of images that are from installations um, in the Whitney Museum of American Art, which was, I think, a bellwether moment at, at the um, age of 101 after Carmen had begun to have some success around the age of 84, I believe. 
And then there are some instances of the um, public artworks, the large scale monumental works, the maquettes and the sketches, and then installations at Listen Gallery, both in the United States and in London, I think. Those are all important because we're going to speak about it um, in a probably non continuous manner, and we'll refer to different things throughout it, and it'll just be happening here in the background. So, thank you that my preamble is over. As I promised um, both Kaylee and Daniel, what I wanted to do, would you like to say anything? <laughs> I just want to say thank you. I mean, it's really wonderful to be here and to be uh, talking about such an incredible artist as Carmen. I mean, and, it's, and, and also thank you, you know, to, to the, the foundation, I mean, to have this work you know, to know that this work has this incredible home here um, is really very special. So I just want to say thanks for that. Thanks for saying that. It, it really is a great evening. I echo those sentiments. Thank you. So um, the first thing that popped in my mind that um, looking at this artist's work, my first exposure was in Carmen's exhibition at the Whitney Museum of American Art in 2016, 2017. And it was not knowing Carmen or her history, and I'm not even, I don't think I even knew her age at the time. I was really taken absolutely enthralled by the immediacy of the work, the contemporary nature, and the physicality of it. And the artist's hand, even though it appeared to have what you would call a minimalist presence, it had an undeniable presence of an artist in her artist's hand. And so as we were discussing, one of the great things about Carmen and her work is the active um, irony of paradox. And the paradox to me is that we have two misattributed tropes, I think two bad tropes that we frequently ascribe to artists who, who finally find success in the art world, who find success in the art world at a later stage, which is the artist has to be working in isolation, which I think she did to a degree, um, and also that either late in life or after the artist's death, they become important or valuable or whatever you want to call it. Um, and those are two vastly different concepts between you know, the intrinsic value, the artistic value, a market value, et cetera. But those two things seem to be really at odds with, the, um, with how her work was discovered and celebrated, ultimately. So that's the first thing I wanted to say. Well, I have something to say about her working in isolation, which is that she wasn't really working in isolation. Um, she was born in 1915. She moved to New York originally in 1939 because she married an American school teacher, Jesse Lowenthal. Um, and during that time, Jesse was part of this kind of intellectual circuit and was friends with a lot of artists. So she was actually very close with Barnett Newman and his wife, many uh, other prominent artists at that time. So she wasn't in isolation. She was out there seeing shows, but she wasn't getting exposure. So her first experience of getting recognition and exposure was when she moved to Paris with her husband in 1948. And he was on a sabbatical, and they lived there until 1953. Um, and during that time, she was able to exhibit her work. She was able to be around other Latin American artists that were in Paris at that time, but also other artists from the United States. Um, interestingly, Ellsworth Kelly was there at the exact same time as her, but they didn't know one another. They never saw each other's art. Um, and at that point, she started to get some exposure. She was showing with the Salon de Realité Nouvelle. Um, and she felt she was really thriving. She really hit her stride there. And then she had to go back to New York because Jesse needed to keep teaching and, and make money for them to live on. And she was kind of heartbroken. And she went back to New York and she couldn't get any shows. And um, one female dealer in New York once famously said about her, um, Carmen, you paint circles around the men in my program, but I won't give you a show because you're a woman. So that was kind of what we should, she was up against in New York. It was a very, very male-dominated field at that time, and abstract expressionism was king, and she was ahead of her time making hard-edge geometric abstraction, which in Paris kind of had an audience, and in the United States at that time, there was just no audience. But she was, she was in the scene to an extent, but also very much on the outskirts of it. What did they call it? at the time, what she was doing. Did they have a name for it, or was it a group of? 
Um, she never affiliated herself with any any particular, you know, style. Um, and I, so I don't think there really was something that you could call it. I think people mm -hmm. often misattribute it as minimalism, which it is not. I mean, it's really joyous. It's about color and form. And certainly there are minimal aspects, but I wouldn't categorize it in that way. Yeah, I think to the point, um, and it goes back to the initial question that, um, you know, the minimalists were large in part white and male. Um, and I think, you know, the, the story, the anecdote that you told really gets to the crux of the fact that she's kind of doubly othered in a place like New York City as a woman and also, you know, as a, La as a Latina, you know, immigrant, you know, and, and whether, you know, it's specific to, um, there, there's obviously, there are some moments of really great, you know, exhibitions and artists getting some traction um, in, in the States, you know, um, and in New York who are from, you know, the kind of Central or, or South America, but not in a way that, you know, breaks into the, the primary discourse in art history, in the art historical circles at that moment. Um, and I think to, to the sort of technical question, I, I think even now, you know, when people call her a minimalist artist, like they, 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 they're using the term in a, I think, a well-intentioned way to describe her work, but in a way that um, doesn't have the like capital M minimalist, you know, connotations that it, it does. So that's why I tend to and tend to hear people use the term geometric abstraction mm -hmm. around around referring to her work. Yeah, I think that maybe that's more a little bit more common now. I wonder sometimes when you mention Barnett Newman and, and Ellsworth Kelly, and if they knew each other and knew each other's work, even if she wouldn't get the show from the gallery artist who said you're painting circles around them, but you're not one of them. Were they? Did they correspond? Did they interact? Did they talk about artwork? Was there another type of? Um, you know, if they weren't showing together publicly, was this part of a fabric of a community that she, when you said she didn't want to leave Paris, was it because? With Barnett Newman, yes. Mm -hmm. They were very close friends. Like, they would have dinner parties and hang out. I'm trying to remember who some of the other artists were. But with Ellsworth Kelly, no. They did not know each other. I don't think they knew of each other's work. I'm sure at some point Carmen found out about his work, because um, he was certainly celebrated at an earlier stage in his life. But, um... But, you know, there were certain artists she knew and certain artists she did not know. And I think related, um, in terms of understanding the, the kind of scene at that moment, so much was centered around galleries and centered around the critical discourse of, you know, art criticism and art writers and magazines. I mean, we think about, like, the major kind of debates and, you know, th that were kind of sometimes knockdown down drag out fights about minimalism and, you know, abex or, and, you know, if they're not talking about you, yeah. you're not a part of it, which is, doesn't mean that when we look back at art history now, we say that that was right or smart. In fact, I think it, it, it should make us think about the critical dialogue that always happens around art and like what's maybe not in the art world capital or the center or the, the primary um, you know, publication of record for whatever art world at the moment. Going back to the type of art that she made and how you categorize it also, um, when she was in Paris, she her abstraction, I don't know if there's any of those paintings um, yeah. on, the, on the slideshow, but um, there were paintings in Paris, she, she had a much more organic abstract style for quite mm -hmm. some time, but then she started oscillating back and forth between a very hard edge style and an organic style. And what happened was she was showing in the Salon de Realité Nouvelle um, and, and one of the critics there said to her about a specific painting, you know, I think there's two or three paintings in this painting. And at first, she thought that was an incredible compliment. She thought, wow, you know, how wonderful. And then she realized what he was actually saying was that there was too much happening in her work. And so she went from painting with three or four colors to paring down to ultimately almost exclusively painting in two colors. Mm -hmm. um, and it was this reduction of uh, extraneous parts, and that was kind of how she got to her mature style. Yeah, when you speak about the artists you've associated her with a little bit, and, and, you, and one thinks about the way they describe their work, did she, at the time, describe her own work that way? Was she, it, did she have a purposeful, you know, you think about the way Barnett Newman talked about his work, 
or maybe some of the other artists, did she think about it that way or talk about it that way? We talked last night about how we felt like she was a little bit more pragmatic, that she just sort of did. She followed the artwork. She followed what whatever the impulses were. In the I don't know that there's much record of her speaking about yeah. her work from the earlier part of her career. No, but, I mean, I think... And it is maybe a nice through line um, for all of her work and leads beautifully to the sculpture is um, she talks about, you know, the beauty of the straight line. Mm -hmm. And it's really important to say, you know, for those who aren't as familiar with her work that like she studies at architecture school and that's where she learns, you know, like, wow, this, the purity, the beauty of the straight line. And it clearly it just you know, is, is the, the distillation that she eventually gets to, you know, to reduce from, the, you know, from the, the kind of more elements to the simple elements. And so that's where it's, it's more, there are more kind of recent quotes about her talking about her work um, than like in the, you yeah. know, in the moments of the, the 60s and 70s, um, yeah. which, yeah, we don't have a lot uh, necessarily reported from that. There's snippets here and there, right? But um, that the, the distillation of, of line and form and color and, and that uh, aspect of purity as also a, um, a, a way to kind of c find clarity in the chaos of the world um, is a really powerful uh, way to, to reconsider art in response to that moment, uh, you know, as well. I was just going to say about architecture, I think one other thing that sets her apart from minimalism is that is that architectural background so much of her work is completely abstract i mean her work is completely abstract but occasionally she titles her work in really literal ways which which is so interesting and there's one painting from 1974 a black and white painting called escorial um, which is a famous church in madrid and it, it it looks like a floor plan of the church but very simplified down and when she does that you realize that there's there's sort of a humor to her work, like she understands that you can see something in abstraction. It, she's not denying that there's some sort of figuration present in abstraction. And I think that's a really unique approach um, for an artist making work that looks like hers. Yeah. You made me think of two things in particular. One was this concept of, um, speaking of paradox, and a little bit of irony, is that um, I think the work Looking at the sculpture that's on Poydras, you know, you, you think of what we would call minimalist as being austere or severe or even cold, but it's really warm and generous. And very, you, you focus as much on these openings and these intersections and the space because of that. Is that how she approached the work when she was creating it or is that something I'm saying about it or we're considering it or, you know, where did she love this austerity of the line maybe perhaps for all that it, um, Suggested. I don't think she saw it as austere, yeah. necessarily. I mean, and, and the interesting thing about the sculptures, and particularly the work that's on Poydras, the drawing for that work was made in 1962. So this is a body of work that she envisioned making in the 1960s, um, but she had no funding to do that. I mean, to make a sculpture is much more expensive than to make a painting. Um, so she... And, it, and it's a particularly interesting because she didn't save any of the sketches from her paintings from this period, um, probably because she didn't have space in her little, you know, one bedroom apartment on 19th Street. Um, but she did save these particular set of drawings of these sculptures that she always wanted to make. And in 1971, she received a, a grant for $15,000 to make, and she used that money to make four of these sculptures in wood and not monumental, you know, domestic scaled. Um, and after that, the, the money ran out and, and the, she was kind of working with a friend who was sort of a hobby carpenter to build the forms and then she was painting them. And she saved them for decades and, and she always wanted to make them and that's kind of where Dan came in. Yeah, I mean, talk about honor of honors. I mean, to, um, to, to help an artist whose work, I mean, I just admired. And I mean, I, I, you'll get a sense that when we're talking about Carmen, we sort of talk about her as like, a saint, you know, because she's just, she's this incredible, I mean, just such an incredible figure um, 
for all of her story, but especially just for her warmth. And, and I do think that the warmth is there in the work. I mean, the color choices are like, it's a Carmen specific color each time that I think brings a lot of her, who she is and you know, um, all of her background uh, into the work. But um, that, you know, I was very lucky. I was working at, as you mentioned, Public Art Fund at the time and, and um, was curating large scale sculpture throughout New York City. and. Um, you know, had, had of course really seen Carmen's paintings and, and actually funny enough, maybe because I was looking at everything through the lens of, of sculpture at that point, I really, I, and I still do to this day, we've talked a lot about it, I see her paintings as also sculptural, part, especially, you know, for the way that um, she wraps color around the, the edge of the canvas. It's not just a flat thing, which is I actually think an interesting distinction from some of the other minimalist, you know, war artists who are making 2D work, um, you know, when, the, when they're making 2D work. But um, that uh, Listen Gallery in, it must have been in like 2015, 2016, um, you know, was working with Carmen to, um, to, to start to think about fabricating these sculptures and that Carmen had also, you know, w who still, she was still creating and drawing and at that point painting every day, um, had made a, a design for a new sculpture, a new estructura as well, um, with a beautiful little maquette of this um, Angulo Rojo uh, work, and fabricated that sort of as almost a kind of proof of concept to then say, well, maybe we should go back through, you know, and, and, and think about how to successfully fabricate and, and where to, um, and how to display Well, and she these. had always wanted to make them in metal. Completely, exactly. And, and to your point, you know, the, the sort of early kind of smaller scale studies were, they were, you know, I intended to be done in this, in this other way, um, eventually, hopefully. Um, and so it really was this just incredible, I mean, like, uh, you know, a, like a career highlight, and hopefully I have a lot of career ahead of me, but I will, I know with absolute certainty that this is a, one of the most incredible things I've ever been a part of, to go to her studio and to, to design the exhibition with her. You know, at that point, she, she wasn't really leaving the studio very much, but she was still having, you know, visitors. So we, we, um, we did Photoshop renderings of the works, you know, as they would be installed at City Hall Park. And, um, and you know, she was very funny at times. She would sort of point to something in a picture and say, we should move that bench. And it's like, this is a city bench. <laughs> You know, it's like it's concrete anchored into the ground, but we'll figure out how to do it. Okay, you know, she wants it, we'll make it happen. Um, and, and, and then especially, uh, you know, just such an important part of it that is really related to, to the beauty of having this work here now is that, you know, this is also a moment, um, you know, in 2016, 2017, you know, in, in, our, in our nation when there's a lot of intense discussion around, you know, the role of immigrants in the country and around the role of women in the country. And, you know, to have that, the debut of, of these works be at City Hall Park in New York City, and also, funny enough, it was sort of a, <laughs> a bit of a complication. Uh, it was the day that the U.S. women's soccer team um, had their victory parade down the Canyon of Heroes, which they throw the ticker tape out of the, the Woolworth building, which, of course, dumps right into City Hall Park. So to do Carmen justice, we had to you know, clean everything up. I'm there in the opening day in my suit, like picking up you know, the confetti or whatever. But, but this is all to say um, that you know, for when some some artists, and it goes back to your first question, when, when a, a truly brilliant artist, whether they've you know, received uh, their due for their brilliance, you know, has a dream project and a vision for something that is so clear and so pure and so honest, you know, as a curator, um, and this is, maybe it's just kind of who I am as a curator, I felt like I had to do everything in my power to make sure that I was working with every you know, ounce of strength I had to fulfill her, her vision in that way. So, and that's enormously the, you know, the same exact perspective that the gallery and everyone involved in the project had, including, you know, Peter Ballantyne, who was, you know, advising on, on making sure that the works were, were fabricated in a way um, that was, uh, you know, up to the standard that, that Carmen had drawn them with real precision back in the 60s. Yeah. yeah. Well, you, you spoke about something I was going to talk about in a little bit of formalism with this concept of painting as sculpture or sculpture as painting. And and um, I don't know if, how, what her feelings were. Perhaps they were not as divided at all. But I did want to ask on the sort of the human side of it with Carmen, was she, her experience with having held on to the drawings and having, must have had a 
strong faith that it would happen. For like 55 years. 55 years. That, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, my point was if she discarded other things, and those were sort of, I guess, in, you know, her, her hope of hopes was that this would be realized at some point or at any point, and then... I think, it, I think the body of Estructura is, is incredibly fundamental to understanding her work, and I think that the Whitney show was a real watershed moment for her career, and there were estructuras in the um, in the exhibition, um, the wooden pieces, a few of the wooden pieces from 1971. But I think one thing that you know, me having the honor of working with her and now working with her estate, um, we published a catalog on the estructuras about two years ago. Um, and Dana Miller, who curated the exhibition at the Whitney, wrote this incredible essay. And she had spent so much time with Carmen in the last few years of her life and really learned all these things that Carmen had never had anyone, you know, to listen to uh, about them before. And they are, they're, they're fundamental to understanding her work as a painter. Um, people, I think, often think of her as a painter first, but I don't think of her that way at all. Um, and I think that the estructuras and these drawings really get to the core of that. Um, and one way that you can also bridge these two areas, and I don't think she saw them so differently, honestly, um, is her most famous series is a, a 15 paintings that she called the Blanco y Verde paintings. She made them between 1959 and 1971. Um, and these works are all white and green, two colors, you know, and she did them in a variety of size and shape. And most of them have these very elongated triangles. And, you know, they're, they're paintings, but like Dan said, they, she paints the turnover edge. So as you go around them, if there's a green triangle hitting the edge of the canvas, it, it bleeds onto the, the side of it and you get this sense of sculptural um, presence. And she called them cuts, they're like cuts in the canvas, she said. And if you look at many of the drawings for the estructuras from the 1960s, they are exact, um, exactly based off of this series of paintings. So you realize she was making this series of paintings thinking sculpturally. Um, and and so the, the white becomes the, the, the main color and then the green becomes like the, the negative space or the cut from it. And, and she, you know, she always made dichromatic work, two colors. And with the estructures, it was the first time she had made works in one color. Mm -hmm. But she would say with the wall-based work, because many of these pieces are, are wall-based sculpture, that the white was that second color. So that also is like a totally radical idea, I think, to be have had in the 1960s. Absolutely, and especially with the estructures when they're off the wall and in public space, the negative space, you know, brings in a dialogue with the color of the city or the, you know, park behind them as well. So there's a, there's a, you know, a sort of, uh, you know, it, it's it's opening up the two color thing to the environment and 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 especially through the the you know audiences engagement as you sort of walk around them, those wedges and you know, um, sculptural dimensions also change in, in a really fascinating way. Um, but they are also, you know. Yeah, extremely precise, and the um, and the negative space, you know, needed to be needs to be, and it currently is installed like very precisely mm -hmm. and perfectly. Mm -hmm. They're kind of unforgiving sculptures. Like if you if if everything is not perfectly level, um, you know, the geometries are off, and they have to be perfectly level. So it's really um, and they you know just. Formally, structurally, they they you know they either link together or they're they're you know designed uh, in ways to fulfill her vision, which is so precise, you know, as as her paintings are in that sense too. Yeah. Well, seeing the piece behind us on the screen gives me a really good indication. I sometimes um, want to make sure that we share with everyone here, so that you can share with people who maybe being introduced to the, the corridor, Porter's Corridor Sculpture Exhibition or Carmen's work, that I think this piece of hers on Porter's was the first permanent North American acquisition of yes, her it work. Is. And it's really fitting, it's the first drawing. You know, it's the drawing from 1962 as well, and a lot of the rest of the drawings for the instructors are, 
you know, 67, you know, 70, I mean, you know, and, and a little bit later in the 60s as well, yeah. New Orleans is sometimes last on some lists that are important, so we really like it when we're first on a list, especially if it impresses our international visitors and friends. It's very but, impressive. Yeah. It's really exciting, yeah. and especially important. because these sculptures have kind of toured around the country. I mean, the fact that there is one here forever, um, and Carmen knew that, you know, this was happening. This started when she was alive. Um, it's really exciting. Yeah. Very exciting for us. Um, you bring up a, a specific point, and I think it's of interest to everyone here, to focus on, you know, you both have relationships with the artwork and the artist, and could you share a little bit about the, the part that the fans of her work, um, you know, fans of the world of art, the, the appreciation for the arc of their career, her background, movements, associations, or whatever, for Carmen herself, this explosive recognition at the time that it happened, what was that like for her, or what did she think about it, or what did she say about it, if anything, at all? I mean, she really kind of took it in stride. I mean, there's a, <laughs> there's a great line in that film where she says, if you wait for the bus, eventually it will come. You know, she, she knew she was good. She knew she had something to say. There were definitely moments in her career when she thought about... Um, getting a job and stopping and her husband was her most steadfast supporter and he insisted you are a painter you will paint you know and she was very lucky to have that support because had she not her you know she probably wouldn't have been a painter and i think that's also you know a testament to her vision is like to hang on to the drawings and say well we'll make them someday you know we'll make the sculpture but even more than that, and this is, again, this is New York City, like storage space is a premium. To hang on to the paintings as well, I mean, and to understand that these are important paintings that need to be seen and need to find their eventual homes, which, thank God, the world finally came around, you know, to her, and, you know, that they have these incredible homes. Um, is just really important and really special, too. So the bus comes, but, <laughs> but, but it comes especially to those who it deserves to come for, wait, you yeah. know? Yeah, and, and those, but also, like, those who are worth waiting yeah. for, you know, is what I think, I think she, understood that what she was doing was so pure and honest and important, yeah. you know, even if she was marginalized for these other really unfortunate and miserable reasons that were finally kind of making some effort to correct. And I think she was really grateful to, yeah. to receive that recognition. I mean, I, I don't think she was, you know, stuck up about it in any way. She was really like, the fact that she was able to live long enough to see this happen, I think was really wonderful for her. I think her biggest heartbreak was probably that her husband died before he was able to see it happen. Um, but um, she was very lucky to have the support of a very dear friend and fellow artist, Tony Bachara, who kind of carried the torch for Jesse and, and helped her and put her um, back in the public eye and um, really you know, spent many, many years of his life um, and, and continues to do so, helping the public see her work. Yeah, and Tony's you know, been such a tireless advocate for her. And, and, and just to sort of address the, the question as well, um, when, when I was you know, visiting with Carmen and Tony was there, it, so much of what Carmen, I think, was processing at this moment of, oh, great, people are finally starting to pay attention and coming and asking questions, was actually like thinking through the history and sharing the history. So Tony would, you know, we, we would have these sessions where we would talk about like, the drawings, the references in the works, you know, and she was, I think in an interesting way, kind of also walking down memory lane and remembering like, oh yeah, there's, you know, this was because of this, or I did this, I was here at this point. So it was also this really beautiful, um, you know, almost kind of like oral history in, you know, constantly in process um, that she was always sharing and, and, and Tony is just like, the ultimate source of knowledge um, and expertise around everything, you know, when it comes to Carmen, too, in that way, yeah. Well, and uh, Tony Bachara is an artist himself and an art uh, professional, and it, w one of the things that's fascinating, if you hang around artists, you know that they general. I mean, all artists, right, you, you are ready to talk about your own work. Tony always, almost exclusively, wanted to talk about Carmen's work, and he has made makes beautiful painting, yeah, beautiful He's a great work. artist, he's yeah. really, yeah. Yeah, beautiful work um, that you can, you can find. 
Um, and I know that that's a whole story. I mean, to turn that page would probably add. That's a whole other talk. But that, that is we a whole have. other. But also, it's it's just an important thing of like an artist. Artist yeah. is a really important artist that collectors, curators, galleries should be paying attention to. You know, artists really have an eye, and they also especially understand, um, you know, what deserves and needs to be appreciated too. So. Yeah, and his role was probably when you think about an advocate and a primary. You know the where all the faith comes from with the work that you did, Daniel, and the work that you did, Kaylee, and Listen Gallery. I mean, the, the um, confluence of events that it took to take the 1962 drawing from a piece of paper to being in form is, is remarkable. I just have to point out this picture while it's up. Thank you. Yeah, you sent that today. Yeah, because yeah, I, I sent this. That. This was a picture that actually Tony took of Carmen with the sculpture. I mean, it, it just... I mean, my gosh, like just how much, how emotional I get even just thinking about, you know, this moment um, is really so important. And it really is a testament to everything you were just describing, you know, about, about Tony um, and just Carmen having this, you know, this vision of making it and, happen. And Carmen passed in 2022. And you said that this was maybe the last time that she left her home. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. That's extraordinary. So, I mean, just to get to see this, you know, in, in see this finally come to reality. I mean, it, it really is just so special. Yeah. Well, we're very happy to have you here and having that piece on Poydras, driving up and down today, looking at it. You, you don't sometimes appreciate something unless you see its absence and, and driving down there and seeing Lonnie Holly and Mapo Kennard and uh, Linda Binglis and um, Arlene Sheckett and uh, John T. Scott and Melvin Edwards and, you know, Enrique Alferez and Ida Kohlmeyer and Carmen Herrera and the list goes on. It's e extraordinary. I'm almost surprised it's legal. I mean, just, you know, how are you not even stopping traffic? You know, I mean, come on. Like, yep. Yep. these things, I mean, they're, and they're also just the greatest hits of, you know, some of my favorite artists, too. I had the honor of working with Mel and, and you know, Carmen, and uh, just such a great group of, of yeah. works you brought together. Yeah. So congrats on that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for being here this evening. Very much appreciate it. And you've been very patient and kind. Um, I, I think we did want to offer the opportunity for questions from the audience if someone has them. Um, I think you all did a fantastic job of sharing your knowledge of, of Carmen and her work. And we're very grateful, of course, for the Hellas Foundation and the appreciation of the presentation of the, the sculpture exhibition there. It truly has changed the landscape of the city. Okay, I think they will bring, thank you for doing that. The floating microphone will come to you. This is one of the pieces from 1971. Hi, um, I was wondering about, because she was envisioning these sculptures so far before they actually got fabricated and I, I wondered if she had a really specific idea about material and like what metal she was going to use or if that was something that kind of came later when they were eventually fabricated. I know that she had a dream to work with Peter Ballantyne, who was Donald Judd's fabricator, um, and that was who made the first sculptures in metal for her. Um, so that was kind of the ultimate dream of, of, uh, of making these works. Um, I don't know if she had a certain type of metal in mind. Um, they're, they're typically aluminum, so they're not too heavy. Um, which is something that's quite practical, I think. Um, I know she was very particular about the effect of the paint that she wanted. They have a very matte um, but very vibrant surface, and that was something that was really hard to achieve and continues to be hard to achieve, is getting that kind of spray coat um, with no imperfections. You know, if there's the tiniest little speck in the paint, we have they have to do the whole paint job over again. Um, so, so that was something she was really particular about. Um, and I think that kind of speaks to the way that she is as an, was as an artist, is um, it was about color and form, maybe less so than material. But especially, um, you know, this was happening while she was still alive and really was active in it. And, you know, there were samples and, exa and examples and everything that were, were really being um, shown and she was making, actively making decisions on. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's always an interesting discussion when things are fabricated after an artist's life, but with these you know, being done while she was still able to you know, make sure, while, while 
everyone was able to make sure they were being done up to her standards um, is really special. I mean, the timing. And like, I mean, we, should, we also just haven't even stated, but she lived such an incredible long life. She I mean, lived through two global pandemics. Yeah, and I mean, the, the crazy thing too, when we were talking about the, usually, you know, at Public Art Fund, there's this whole thing we love to, we love to I'm not at Public Art Fund anymore, but we love to say, um, uh, you know, this is the artist's first public sculpture exhibition. And, and actually, I was doing research on it, I was like, oh man, it's actually not her first public exhibition of, of sculpture. She made a sculpture that she exhibited in a park in, in Havana in 1937. I mean, like, it's not a minimalist sculpture like this. It was basically a student work, but like, oh my gosh, just the range, the longevity of her practice um, is incredible. But especially, we're all so grateful that, you know, this was able to be done in her lifetime. So she really was very active in, in the decisions about how it was made. Couple more, thank you. Well, I'd like to thank you for this wonderful evening here and also to the Hellas Foundation for the Public Art on Poydras. The last slide that was up with her looking at her sculpture, where was that? And uh, she's in the wheelchair. Yeah, that was City Hall Park in, in Lower Manhattan in New York City, uh, which is where the exhibition Estructuras Monumentales debuted. Um, and, and then the works- has moved here. Uh, yes, exactly. So, so that was first in New York City, and then the works traveled, uh, a version of the exhibition traveled to Houston, to Buffalo Bayou Park, uh, and then it's so special that this work is here now. Yeah. Yeah, it's a permanent acquisition. Lucky you all, and lucky us when we get to come visit, yeah. Hi, I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about her identity as a Cuban. Um, you spoke, spoke about her as a New Yorker and a Cuban American, but I'm interested in understanding how her identity played a role um, as a Latin American woman. I think it was complicated for her. I think she never wanted to be, she wanted to be seen as an artist. She didn't want to be seen as a woman artist or a Latin American artist or a Cuban artist, she was an artist. So there was that part of her. Um, at the same time, I think she was a very intelligent, politically minded person. She came from a very intellectual family in Cuba. So she certainly had her opinions um, and her, or her feelings of, you know, her pride in her Cuban heritage. I think she just kept those two things very separate. I mean, it, it, it may be, is worth mentioning that the, the piece, the drawing in 62, I mean, 62 is a really important year. If I remember correctly, this is the Cuban Missile Crisis happening just before she makes this drawing. And I, I don't know, I mean, maybe, you know, you can read something into the kind of the one form over another, but like, which as you said, there's, there are, are readings of her work, but that wasn't like the, the main thing that she was trying to, you know, to address. It's also essentially a mother-child figure. I mean, there, there's a lot of different, ways to take it, but I do think that um, she remained very engaged with, you know, the, the conversation about, you know, between Cuba and, and her, her you know, then home in the States as well. Yeah. It's probably something that we can speak less to because it didn't really come up in conversations around her art. Um, but I know from talking to Tony about it um, that she, she had, you know, a very strong pride in her Cuban identity. I can't remember. Um, it's in the Great Whitney question. catalog. Dana, I remember, mentions it in her essay. Um, but it was someone in it was someone in Paris. I can't remember. I'm sorry. So it was probably in French. So. <laughs> <laughs> Appropriately so. <laughs> well, exceptional evening. Thank you to the Hellas Foundation, David Kirstein, Jesse Haynes. Thank you, Daniel Palmer. Thank, Thank you, you for Kaylee having Dean. Us. Thank you for being here.